The title of this session is Trust and Ethics, Has the Legal Sector Lost Its Way? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we kind of... The, for those who don't know, I write various things on lawyers and often on lawyers' ethics. And in recent years, I have covered allegations of some seriousness, usually, against Clifford Chance, Freshfields, Alan and Overy, Herbert Smith Freehills, the lawyers at Rolls-Royce, uh, Linklaters, lawyers at Barclays, Stewart's Law, Deckert's, the Royal Institute of S Chartered Surveyors, Field Fisher, several QCs, at least one, possibly two of which are in the House of Lords, Womble Bond Dickinson, Cartwright King, a then sitting president of the Law Society, Lloyd H. Boss, uh, and RBS. And in the last year or so, I have uh, just compared that list to the lefty lawyers that the government worries about. <laughs> Serious point. Uh, and in the last year or so, I have written extensively on the post office where lawyers inside and outside the post office have participated in and bear some responsibility for, I would say, in my view, serious and extensive miscarriages of justice. And if you followed the inquiry yesterday, you would have heard some very pointed questions asked about a lawyer who has been the most senior criminal practitioner in the field, and also some interesting questions of a, a former much respected and respected by me, senior judge. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the lawyers in the post office case has on his website a quote praising him for being a steamroller who flattens his opponents. I paraphrase only slightly. Um, <laughs> it would not be the case that each of these stories proves an ethical problem, but many do, and they all give rise to serious questions for the lawyers uh, involved. If I can emphasise my point uh, just a little, I talk to in-house lawyers and practitioners regularly, train some of them on ethics, and I am told regularly that uh, even or perhaps especially leading firms, with one or two notable exceptions, do not take ethics sufficiently seriously. I have heard a leading culp misstate ethical priorities as client first, that's not right, and another leading partner who had used to advise the SRA regularly celebrate his and his partner's ignorance of the code of conduct. And I have listened to sometimes toe-curling, actually heartbreaking stories of in-house lawyers either slipping into or pressured into ethical lapses of sometimes profound significance, sometimes often perhaps ruining their lives and mental health as a consequence also. So, yes, I have a view on the question, but so too do our speakers, and it's my job to introduce them. The Legal Services Board have invited four absolutely marvellous speakers, two deliberately from outside the profession and two from inside the profession, although I don't think they're typical insiders, if I might say so. Uh, uh, a few words on them by way of introduction, and then we'll get going. Zelda Perkins is famous for breaking her non-disclosure agreement with Harvey Weinstein, to shine a light not on Harvey Weinstein, but on the practices of lawyers protecting business and failing to protect the victims of sexual harassment and other wrongs. She was tremendously brave. With Professor Julia McFarlane, she has founded, can't buy my silence, she's wearing a badge today, a <laughs> campaign group, I'm sure she's going to tell us about it, a campaign group devoted to ending the use of NDAs for anything other than their original purpose, the prevention of sharing commercial confidential commercial business information. Jeremy Barton joined KPMG UK as general counsel in 2015, and he has uh, been GC at the Boston Consulting Group and Ernst Young Global, as well as deputy general counsel at Anderson Worldwide, where he found himself having to deal with the aftermath of the Enron scandal. And as we will know, KPMG has had its own struggles recently with regulators and ethics. So we're delighted to have Jeremy here to share his perspective. Robert Barrington is there. Robert's there on screen, thank God. <laughs> uh, is Professor of Anti-Corruption Practice at the Centre for the Study of Corruption in the University of Sussex. He was formerly the head of Transparency International uh, in the UK, the leading anti-corruption NGO, and he chairs their International Council. He's been leading the charge recently in suggesting lawyers need to rethink their ethics as professional enablers of corruption. Jennifer, our final uh, speaker, Jennifer Swallow, is a lawyer, business leader, consultant, and coach with extensive experience as a GC and helping high-growth high tech 
companies, including leadership roles at Yahoo, Wise, did I get that right, is that the name? And LawTech UK, uh, which we heard about earlier. She has, if I may say so, made a number of telling interventions in the debate on in-house lawyers' ethics, most recently arguing for contractual strengthening of in-house uh, independence. The structure of the session, we're going to hear a challenge from two of our speakers, Zelda and Robert, first, and then I'm going to try and bring in Robert and Jennifer for their views from the coalface, if you like, so we'll try and get a bit more of a discussion going rather than four talking heads in series. We'd love to spend as much time talking as possible, so we'll try and take questions towards the end of that session. So, uh, Robert, if I may go to you first. We've got about five minutes or so, if you can try and stick to that. Five, five or six, is that right? Thank you, Richard, and good afternoon, everybody. I want to start with a couple of apologies. Um, actually, three apologies. The first is that I'm not a lawyer, so I might sound extremely ignorant to um, everybody else in the room. Um, the second is that I need to uh, leave just before the end of the panel, so I'll just quietly disappear from the screen. And the third is I can see, um, looking at the room, that I seem to be four times the size of any of the other panels. <laughs> 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 uh, that, that may be the best I get. But, um, anyway, um, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm an anti-corruption um, uh, researcher. And over recent years, it's been clear that abundant information has become available of, uh, first of all, a wealthy global cadre who extract wealth from their own countries. And uh, secondly, that London is a destination and a clearinghouse for this corrupt capital, as it's called. And what the research has also found is that lawyers, as well as other, oh. have been a party to this activity uh, in a number of ways, uh, assisting transactions, providing legal services for individuals and their network of companies and families, uh, and sometimes reputation laundering, for example, through slap suits. Uh, Anti-corruption campaigners have, uh, to date, been exploring how anti-money laundering legislation could be used to circumscribe this. Uh, and new laws like unexplained wealth orders have been introduced um, off the back of those campaigns. But what we now realize is that even if these AML laws were being well implemented, which they're not actually, uh, there is still a problem. Um, and that problem is that there is seldom a criminal offense that is provable uh, to the degree necessary in English courts. Uh, and in cases of uh, kleptocracy and state capture, both the laws themselves and the law enforcement mechanisms uh, and the judiciary are bent to the will of those who are extracting the wealth. So the sort of fundamental principles of dealing with this through an, uh, a legislative AML approach don't work. So we've therefore got a situation in which London law firms are acting for corrupt oligarchs and kleptocrats entirely within the law. That perpetuates the corruption in the country of origin uh, and it discredits the UK. It's not in the public interest, and it seems to put the interests of the clients above the public interest. And because there's no provably criminal contact, uh, conduct, the, the challenge is essentially an ethical one, but also an ethical one with practical implications. The ethical principle is clearly, should I act for corrupt oligarchs and kleptocrats? And the practical implication is, how do I know who is corrupt? Currently, the legal profession is drawing the ethical boundaries in the wrong place, in that more or less anything goes. And that diminishes the profession, um, which society needs to be in good standing at a time when the independence of the judiciary and the rule of law are being challenged by politicians, as our previous speaker uh, has mentioned. It also diminishes the law firms involved, uh, though some of them don't seem to mind that, and it diminishes the, eye, the UK in the eyes of key international partners. So in my view, the first step uh, in trying to address this is simply to accept that this is a problem. But even that seems extremely hard for the legal profession to do. Um, and I have to say the Law Society has not distinguished itself uh, in its own um, approach to this. Um, and standard arguments are rolled out about access to justice, the right to representation and innocent until proven guilty, uh, all of which have merit in certain circumstances, but uh, uh, certainly should not be applied in a blanket way to this issue. So let me finish with a very simple message. Self-regulation of the legal profession has failed. Uh, that gives a very stark problem because the legal profession has been self-regulated for hundreds of years. If the profession doesn't change itself, it's more likely to have change forced upon it. 
So I think the challenge for the profession is to take ownership of the fact that this is a problem, apply the very fine minds of the legal profession to working out what some solutions might be, and not to remain in denial. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And um, we'll head, head straight over for Zelda. So, Zelda, please. Hi. Um, well, thank you very much, everybody, for having me here as a true outsider and normal person. <laughs> um, <laughs> I definitely won't be talking in legalese, and I won't be as erudite as Robert, but there's a lot of similarity in um, some of the issues that he's talking about in terms of what brought me to where I am today and needing to found Can't Buy My Silence. I was brought to that by um, the experience of signing a non-disclosure agreement with Harvey Weinstein. Um, and for me, and I've, I've said this many times, um, but I still don't think it's really heard, is that it was not so much Harvey Weinstein's behaviour that was the problem for me. I mean, obviously it was a huge problem. But what really broke me was what happened when I had access to justice and discovered that I had no access to justice. Um, the problem started the moment I was in a room with a lawyer. I thought that I was going somewhere where I was going to receive help. It seemed very clear to me. Um, and I was disavowed of that almost immediately. Um, there were lots of academic reasons why this was so, and I'm not suggesting that I was necessarily given bad advice. But I think the advice I was given was advice that was driven by the fact, as it seemed to me, that regulation and legislation doesn't support the legal profession to make ethically strong decisions. Um, this was something that had not occurred to me when I went to speak to a lawyer. Um, I had presumed that lawyers, priests and doctors were unimpeachable. I was very young. <laughs> um, uh, and I think one of the biggest problems that we've been talking about today is the challenge that lawyers have in their role of being winning, being adversarial, and actually taking into account ethics. And inclusivity. Everyone's been talking about inclusivity today. And the glaring thing that comes to me here is about lawyers actually being inclusive to their client's experience, whatever gender, race, background, ability. Your client's experience as a lawyer, you have to understand, and I think that's where the huge gap is. I'd like to say that there's been an improvement in the time that I broke my, in the time that I signed my non-disclosure agreement to breaking it, but the reality is there has been no change. There's been no regulatory change and there's been no legislative change. The only thing that's changed is whistleblowing laws. Um, the SRA has tried to put out warning notices, but as far as I'm concerned, as a layperson, a warning notice is a conversation. It concerns lawyers at the moment that it's there, but in another few weeks, days, months, years, that warning notice is yet again ignored because the guidance was the same in 98 when I, when I signed that agreement as it is today. Now, for those of you who don't know my story, the agreement that I signed, and I had very good legal representation, and I had counsel, very good counsel, but the agreement that I signed stipulated that I couldn't aid the police, that I couldn't speak to a therapist, that I couldn't speak to the HMRC, that I couldn't hold a copy of this agreement. Now, my question is, why is it that my own lawyers were not held to account for that? I understand that the company representing Harvey Weinstein were doing their best to represent him to his best interest. But what about my interests? And why were my lawyers not given more support or ability to push back on, on the, the clauses that were being presented to me? And why was I ever left in a room and advised by my own team to, to sign an agreement like that? Nothing ha no disciplinary action has been taken to either of these law firms. The SRA have tried, but as a layperson, from what I'm seeing, regula the regulators don't have enough power. And the more people that I've spoken to over the last five years since I've been in this environment have rather tragically said to me that I should give up working 
on the regulators, because to me, the only way that this is going to improve is by lawyers being supported by regulation, not prescribed, but supported to make the right decisions, and by legislation changing. And those are the two prongs that I've gone after. And I'm thrilled to be here today because already this morning I've had conversations that have made me feel that there is possibility of progress <coughs> with the regulators. And I think that's incredibly important. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so just to pick out a few themes, uh, the profession might be in denial. Um, Self-regulation may have failed. Um, Legislation and regulation is needed to support ethical behaviour. Um, adversarialism and, uh, was mentioned. There's, I think there's a really interesting difference between Robert and Zelda's point of view, which is Robert, in a way, is saying certain kinds of clients, the lawyers bend, bend over backwards to take on board the client's experience and the client's needs. And other lawyers, the lawyers who were representing you in your case, Zelda, don't. Why is that? What can we do about that? So, um, Jennifer, can I come to you first? Now, in, what, in what ways do you agree with what... Yeah. The, the sorts of things that Robert and um, Zelda are saying. A, a lot of this rings true for me, and it makes me wonder if we need to reframe the regulatory principle, the regulatory requirement of lawyers for independence to interdependence. So for me, this concept of independence is so fundamental to the purpose of lawyers. You know, it encapsulates everything about, about what lawyers are for in society and the connectivity with the rule of law. And my sense is that we have this um, boiling frog situation where our peripheral vision has closed down away from the societal and wider stakeholder environment and the, in this case the, the, the client, the human concept, down into um, the, the myopic nature of, of personal interests or client interests. And my, my sense is that it is a bigger problem than we're currently acknowledging. And my, my experience is, is, is the in-house world and, and working inside businesses. And the conversations I've had with GCs over the years, I mean, uh, my own experience as a general counsel in various companies, um, th the stories are appalling and terrifying. Um, even after we did the group working paper after the session w with you, Richard, on the post office, the calls I was receiving, the messages I was receiving from lawyers in-house are, are, are just scary, like criminality, illegality, bullying, powerlessness, um, pressure. And, um, yeah, I, th I, th I think that this is a worse situation than, than we are, we're acknowledging. And, and I just don't think independence is, is at the fore. In, in, it's, it's not alive in our conversations as, as lawyers in our day-to-day. -day. It's not a topic on the conference circuit. It's not on the board. You, often it's not built into board governance, and it's not um, on the table of, or discussion topics for boards. Uh, it's certainly not something that I've seen regulators um, or the professional uh, representative bodies um, holding us... To hold, to, to hold ourselves to account with. So, yeah, I, I, a lot of it rings true for me. Thank you very much. Jeremy, what are your thoughts on Do you, you recognise the same problems as Robin Zelda? So, uh, I, I certainly recognise the problems and the issues that have been raised. Um, from where I sit, I encounter different types of problems, I think. Yeah. So, uh, I'm not in private practice. I'm, I'm internal in an organisation. Um, I think... My organisation is interesting because um, part of our business, which is audit, has a very clear public interest. Uh, and I think that sometimes um, the, the legal profession, um, perhaps it, it's so focused on the here and now, loses sight some of the public interest element in the role. Yeah. Now, when you're faced with a, a public interest as a professional, um, it seems to me you are perpetually having to balance um, not obvious choices and dilemmas and, and, and uh, challenges. So um, your, your first question is, what, it, what is the public interest? And you will speak to different people who have different points of view on what the public interest is. And you have this range of situations which will go from the extreme, where you could say what is right and what is wrong is absolutely crystal clear, and you can come to another end of the range, especially in the commercial world, where it's not so clear as to what is right and what is wrong. 
And what I try to do in my team and our approach, I think, in our organization is to try and equip individuals, and this comes, I think, about a little bit to, to the point as to is there support for individual professionals, um, to equip individuals in how to face into challenges which boil down to being ethical dilemmas, choices, questions. And so how you, you, you said that it was different in your organisation. How do lawyers f face public interest questions differently from auditors, for instance? What's the, what's the different approach of lawyers? Why is it that lawyers take a, an approach which doesn't pay so much attention to that? I think um, the, um, the reporting out by an auditor to the public through its, that piece of work is quite different to lots of work that a lawyer will do, which may be we've had the discussions of, of uh, the adversarial, the representative. If you're representing a client and you're a litigator, there's a different question as to, well, what is the public interest? The public interest in a piece of litigation may be that due process has been followed and that you're following the rules of criminal procedure or, or li a civil litigation procedure, and your focus may be on that. Is, is there, at the same time in the legal profession, the step back and looking at the, the public interest of your role? Okay. Uh, Jennifer, what, what, do you, what do you think might be driving lawyers' thinking around public interest? Do you have a sense of how they grapple with that question? Is that something which they think is relevant to them? In the in-house context, it's just not at the fore. The, at the fore is, my client needs this, my client is my employer. And, and my experience with in-house counsel, and this is not everyone or all the time, but it is very common that lawyers in-house often don't know that they are the boiling frog. Mm. Or if they are, they don't know what to do about it. Because mm. they're in this dynamic of capture, that they're, they're, they're owned by the client in an employment context. My boss decides what I get paid, whether I advance, how my reputation is is. And um, that my boss is actually not my client. Mm. But there's a misconception that, that they are. So I think there are dynamics in-house that um, create the boiling frog. And how do, they, how do they look? So, I mean, I see that a lot in my work. The, um, the lawyers take instructions from the CEO, typically, or the CFO, some powerful individual, or Harvey Weinstein, or whoever it might be. You're going to do this for us. Find a way of doing this. How do, how do lawyers take a broader view how do lawyers address the because the client is the organization and that can be quite a nebulous thing right that's quite a difficult how do you think they address well, or, or, or not it, 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 to me it's quite straightforward your, your shareholders are your are your client yeah. the shareholders have a responsibility to other stakeholders and with the ESG narrative we all now need to be thinking about the wider impact of the the business decisions and the shareholders are represented by the board. So for me, it's super straightforward. Your board is a representative of your client. So if you're only engaging internally with your boss or the lead leaders of different teams, then you aren't serving. Um, but you know, there are different, and this is part of it. I think there are different ways, particularly in house, that people manage the independence piece and the thinking about the societal aspect. Some leaders have this as something that they talk about at team meetings. Yeah. You know, and they have a, a mechanism of, of having a sort of four eyes check or a, a discourse when something, uh, alarm bells pop up. But at the core of it, it's, it's, it's just not alive in your training yeah. after you qualify yeah. and, and, in, and in how you're measured on success. Yeah, I mean, you, go, you look at legal conferences, particularly in-house conferences, it's all about being commercial. It's very little about being independent or being objective. Well, and, or... and even worse than that, the lawyering is put second to the commerciality. Business person first, lawyer second, yeah. is the strap line that I think people who've used will just be later, will be feel cringy about having allowed those words to come out of their mouth. And, uh, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and do you think, so we talked about in-house lawyers, but do you think it's different for private practitioners or is it the same? Because mm. well, I know what's going on. I was just going to this law. Slightly aghast because you know when you're talking about public interest, certainly from the experience I had personally, and um, from the experiences that I am privy to on a daily basis, daily basis, mm. um, all all the, the the lawyers are absolutely looking at public interest. They don't want the public interest, <laughs> you know. Obviously, I'm dealing with NDA, so yeah, that's yeah. an area where they're trying to avoid any form of public interest. Yeah. In, in, in my case, we had an in-house lawyer and we had a, a, you know, a big uh, top 
five global law firm representing um, Weinstein. And the whole point of that was to stop there being any public knowledge at all. Mm -hmm. If there had been any ethics involved, we wouldn't have been in the situation we were in. And it was something that I still find absolutely mystifying, that anyone could sit in a room and and not see that there was an ethical issue on the table that yeah. w w was more important than the client's yeah. desire. Um, so in-house commercial, it, you know, when it comes to what the driving factor is, I don't see it very often being public I think, interest. I, I think you have got a point that, that this incentivization, this independence question that Jennifer's highlighted in in-house, um, you can see in the private practice. Um, in, in this sense, that if you're um, uh, one of the influences on you in in-house is that your client is also your employer, which is the, 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 um, the dynamic that Jennifer's pinpointed. <coughs> but in private practice, and I probably, you know, to be totally honest, probably benefited from this, that I have used law firms who know me and understand the firm, yeah. and um, they presumably have some incentive in continuing in a relationship with me, which is a commercial relationship. It's not yeah. an employment relationship, yeah, yeah. but there is a commercial because I pay their fees. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think this, this question of getting um, to a position where the, the public can rely upon lawyers in those situations. In other words, lawyers are in a situation of being paid. There are lawyers who are not paid for doing other work, and that happens, of course. Yeah. But where lawyers are being paid and their advice is being given to those who are paying them, how do you make sure that the, right, that, that the lawyers are doing the right thing in, in the moment? And the right thing in the moment may, on the one hand, be, yes, fighting the corner for your client, absolutely. But on the other instance, at the moment, in that moment, the right thing might be to say, stop. And then what happens when the lawyer says, stop? And how do you support them when that's needed? Can I try and bring Robert in? Because I don't want to leave him sitting at his desk uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes the, uh, before he has to go. The, um, Robert, have you got any thoughts on how, how we get lawyers to take public interest more seriously? You talked about being more careful about the clients that they act for. Did you have further thoughts on that or any other ideas about the sorts of things that lawyers need to be doing if they're not going to be um, enabling the kleptocracy, if I can put it in those terms? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's right that the conversation is centred around the public interest. And the problem is that's a very contested term, of course. Um, I should just say it slightly troubles me that Jeremy is in the position of having to judge what is in the public interest, not because I have any lack of faith in uh, him and his judgment, but because he might have an off day or um, he might be off with a cold and somebody less good might be in his place. So, you know, if it's going to come down just to an individual judgment call by somebody who is already under a lot of pressure to take a different um, uh, uh, position, maybe one that's more in line with uh, the firm's commercial drivers, um, then that I think is problematic. So that suggests that the solution lies uh, partly with the individual lawyers, um, maybe how they're trained and uh, what the expectations are for them in terms of um, professional probity, but also um, uh, for some uh, guidelines across the profession as a whole. But just on this question of um, uh, public interest and um, uh, the question of harm and you know who the victims are, uh, one of the issues we find in looking at um, these things that are happening overseas, the kleptocracy and the grand corruption, is that the victims are very distant. Um, and often we won't hear about them for uh, for many years. So you can see that um, some rich kleptocrat or oligarch has turned up in London with a bundle of money. Um, they'll be able to, you know, say that they um, got it legitimately, and they'll probably have a fake paper trail to show that uh, it will not be examined in much detail. Um, so um, uh, we have this slightly perverse situation in which. Uh, an argument that says uh, you shouldn't take on those people uh, as clients makes them the victim, uh, where in fact the victims are um, the people who, uh, whose money they have stolen from the countries um, uh, run by kleptocracies. So, you know, I think that question of public interest, is it the public interest of upholding the rule of law in the UK or is it the public interest of the victims who are overseas uh, is really critical to tease out. But I'm not sure that we can leave it to individual lawyers to make that judgment. I think there need to be better regulation systems and processes around teasing out those ethical questions. I guess I just come back to my um, uh, main point as well, which is 
I think the answer to this isn't to say it's not a problem, and not only is it not a problem, uh, that those who are saying it's a problem are the problem. Um, and using arguments around access to justice and right to representation and so on to defend what, to my mind, is the indefensible. You know, I think the legal profession has to move on um, uh, from that very defensive position. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, uh, to come to say, the, one of the things that's really interesting is the way, how quickly the big firms got the reputational point in relation to Russian clients in particular and started to panic and shed clients. And, uh, and it was the reputational point. It wasn't the ethical point or the public interest point. It was that this is going to hurt our business is actually what was driving it. Jeremy, you're itching to come in and I'm going to move on. Well, it, it was just to respond to, to, to Robert's question, which is a very fair question. Um, and uh, I suppose by analogy, let me share in my organisation how we have some oversight of these public interest calls. And, and it might be that there's some learning into the legal profession, actually. So the large accounting firms, by regulation, uh, each have what is called a public interest body. So we have um, a group of individuals who you might think of a little bit like a corporate non-executives. Um, but they are not there for the commercial benefit of the organization. They are there to provide an outside-in oversight of our public interest, uh, satisfaction of our public interest duties, if I can put it like that. And so there are two things that that body actually sees. They actually see the output of our engagement and client onboarding process. So we have an engagement and client onboarding process that does look at the ethics of doing work with certain organizations. So there is reporting that comes up to the committee around our approach to that, and they can feed, feed in at that, at that level, not in specific decisions because they are independent in that sense. And then the other is, is just quickly, in, 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 auditors have to review their own independence with their clients. So to Robert's question is, can an individual review their own <laughs> um, role? And again, how we assess the independence is something also that comes up to that public interest body um, so, uh, overall to review. So I, I mean, I guess um, th from the outside looking in at the audit industry, it doesn't feel like the audit industry is very good at that, right? The, uh, that's the sort of... That's well, the, that was well the, of course, the, and, and it's for that reason that the, the regulator has leaned in, yeah. that we've had the creation of these sorts of arrangements to help and support us in, in doing that. So it's, we're, we're certainly not saying that we've got it sussed or perfect, but no. we're, we're, we're trying to improve and, and, and get better. OK, thanks. Um, Jennifer, can I come back to you? I, uh, what, what do you think the regulators can do to help? Mm. And Zelda talked about supporting lawyers yes. to make better decisions, and I know that's something you're interested in. It, it, what can it, the regulators do it, to help? It is, and it also fascinates me that in Zelda's situation, what she's just described, I'm sitting here just like, uh, it's just, a, it feels awful to know that that happened to you and yet there's no sanction that we can all look to and go, that was bad, must not do that. <laughs> right? To me, to me, I find that astounding. And, and I, 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 I really question why that is and, and how we're in this, these shades of grey that lawyers work within that we don't have that absoluteness. That, to me, is disturbing. As to where we can go with, so I, I, I have personally called regulators when I have needed support and there has been none Mm. So, t to me and, and the people I work with who are in difficult situations, they need to be able to call someone. Do you mean sort of advice? Advice or, you know, can you come and have my back because it's just my backbone against these people yeah. as a lawyer. Yeah. That's, a, that's a difficult situation to be in. So, you need a governance infrastructure around you, but you need your regulator to be useful. Yeah. The other part of it, I think, is the, is the, the profile that we put to these standards and that's for the regulators to do that. Like, the regulators can say, not this, yes, that. And we don't, we just, we just haven't got that profile. So I think it's a combination of being there on an ad hoc basis, raising the profile, increasing the training and discourse. I just renewed my practicing certificate. At no point in my flow with the Sisters Regulation Authority was I reminded of my regulatory duties. Yeah. At no point. So we've got some basic stuff that we can do here. And, and I have to say, just from, from, from the public's point of, mm. point of view, yeah. you know, I keep giving, keep saying to people who come to me, you know, when they've fallen foul of a, of a NDA and what I would consider bad lawyering, yeah. and I say, you need to go and report it to the regulator, mm. you need to go to the SRA, and they say, well, oh, it's too complicated and it's really there's so many obstructions to doing that, and then you have to go through quite a lengthy and complicated process to make complaints. And, mm. and, and they don't want to. And I keep trying to say, mm. well, the paper trail is really important to make change. It might not <coughs> do mm. something 
concrete for you. Yeah. And that's actually not a very helpful thing to be saying to somebody who's, yeah. who's desperate and needs, needs change. No. And, and they, yeah, sorry. No, well, I was just going to say, you know, I, you know, throughout this process, I worked extensively with the SRA and I went through a very extreme complaint process. Yeah. And it was, it was very rigorous and very hard. And, I mean, I was 25 years on from the incident. Yeah. And so it was possible for me to emotionally go through what was essentially a private court case mm. where I had to give you know, four days of evidence, you know, I was sitting in a room giving four days of evidence to two lawyers and being questioned and, you know, being very exact in questioning. And not very many people are going to want to go yeah. through that process where actually what they're, what they're doing is reporting poor practice from the lawyer. Yeah. And my whole history was being looked at yeah. as if I was in a sort of court of law. Where yeah. all I was trying to do is saying, I don't think that these lawyers were behaving correctly and they certainly didn't have the backup to behave correctly. Like, Can I add one point, yeah. which is there's something very powerful about being able to point to something on the internet, for example, that says this is the... This, this is the and it's not just a, a sort of principle. It's a best practice guidance or it's a... In the case that we put a, a draft, um, it's a template employment agreement amendment. Yeah. You know, these types of physical things that everybody can point to and say the regulator backs that. Yeah. Yeah, OK, great. Uh, maybe that, that's a good point to throw it open to the room. Just let me just see okay. a few hands and then I'll think where to go. Um, uh, can I take um, the question, the lady with the brown cardi there? Is it a cardi? I'm not sure it is a cardi. Might be Sarah, is it Sarah? Not sure about lady. Um, th thanks very much. I, uh, useful in this area, as in many others, to look at analogies with other sectors and others who do it perhaps better. Um, and it just occurred to me, I was in a safeguarding refresher course yesterday, uh, which um, a lot of PE coaches had to do, and as I'm a trustee of the charity, I had to do it too. Um, and if you're a PE teacher, you have to do safeguarding uh, training at least once a year. Um, you have to be reminded of it and sign something probably on a, every term to say that you're doing this. If you see anything or hear anything in any part of your professional life that you think is a bit off, you have a duty to report. Yeah. And not just a duty to report, you then get the backup for whoever it is. I'm sure it doesn't always work brilliantly, but the system is very, very... There's many layers to it. Um, and both the PE teachers, uh, but also the, the people who are regulating them and who have got their backs... You know, are, you know, are under a duty to make sure that things are done properly. Yeah. And I just wonder if, the, if legal regulation could learn from them about how it is possible to do this sort of thing and how it can be done better. Yeah, the direction's been away from that kind of compulsory education, hasn't it? But the, um, um, the gentleman there... Hi, Brian Rogers from the Access Group. Um, we've seen a lot in the past about uh, lawyers being called fat cats and things like that by the media. Mm. We've seen no uh, comment really from the legal sector calling out the post office lawyers and what's going on, and I appreciate there may be regulatory issues going on, but with everything that everybody has said today, clearly the, you know, we should be getting out there and telling people that not all lawyers are unethical and we're going to call out those who are. Yeah. Does anybody want, I mean, I've got a view on that, but does anybody want to respond to why that... I mean, I think I know why that doesn't happen, but does anybody want to say why they think that doesn't happen? I think the, um, uh, the fact is that not, not every lawyer is, is bad ethically. So I think we, we can hopefully all agree that. Um, in terms of when you encounter it, our view is that um, you shouldn't now, in today's world, you don't hold back and you don't cover up. I think that's, that, that is a shift. And so from our, our perspective, we wouldn't cover up. I can see John Flood's hand. Ah, oh, I'll take you next. John Flood, um, Professor of Law and Society at Griffith University. I was struck by the point you made, Jennifer, about the commercial aspect. And it seems to me that that is probably pervasive throughout the entire legal profession 
um, in-house private practice and so on. Because even within the law firm, one in effect is working for one's employer, uh, uh, who could be a, a partner or, or senior associate or something like that. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I mean, I, I can see what you want in terms of the regulator backing you up in some way, uh, uh, but I don't see a way out of it at the moment. Uh, um, I don't see uh, the SRA providing the right kind of um, uh, uh, backing for that sort of thing. And, um, and given that so much of what lawyers are doing these days is global, um, unless there's some kind of global regulation, <laughs> Uh, I don't see that you know, you know, national regulation is going to be sufficient uh, uh, anyway, you know, because you can't always enforce it across borders. So I think there's a... I just don't quite, at the moment, see how one overcomes that. May, may I comment briefly? Please do. I, I, I agree, and it would be fantastic if the regulators would step in, but it's something that lawyers need to do for themselves. So, you know, the, when you onboard into any organisation, is the basis of your contract clear? Does everybody understand that you are clear on your regulatory um, framing and your independence and interdependence? Um, do you have the governance structures that support when the weather gets stormy that you can lean on that? Do you have the proper relationships with your board that means that you, it's not just you? That there's a whole load of things that we can be doing that aren't really standard, that should be standard, and we can do that together. We don't have to wait for anybody to do that. That there's, there are templates and things that we put together, um, myself and, and Karen Fenton, myself and, and, and others who are part of this working group that are available online. That people can just act, act now if they want to. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Lubna Shuja. I'm the president of the Law Society. And I have to say, my blood pressure has been going up listening to you guys today. Um, I, I have to defend the profession. I've listened to what you've said. I don't accept at all that lawyers don't care or that they ignore the public interest. I have to say that. Whatever. La lawyers are regulated. Ever, seriously. Lawyers, Ever. lawyers are Nobody regulated. Nobody's saying they always do that. Well, you know. Nobody's saying that. Major majority, straw man, right? <laughs> majority of lawyers at do their best okay, to act majority. ethically. Yeah, okay. They do. They are regulated. They, they, they act with integrity. They are required to act within a code of conduct. And they do. The majority of lawyers abide by principles and the regulations that they're required to. Um, and, and that's been shown. I think you, you alluded earlier, you know, the issue with Russia. Lawyers pulled out. They, they, they stopped, um, you know, they closed their firms in Russia. <laughs> And, and they pulled out. So I, I just want to give an answer because one of the things that I'm planning to do um, as part of my plan as president is actually, and, and this is very serious, to open up a debate on professional ethics because I accept this is an area where it's not clear. It's, it's an area where, you know, situation is rapidly changing, public opinion is changing, and ethical behaviour is often shaped by that. So my question, actually, for the panel is who decides what's ethical and what criteria do they use to do that? And I genuinely want to hear what the opinion would be on that. OK, it's a really good question. Uh, let's take Robert first, because Robert might have to shoot off in about a minute. Robert, um, give it your shot. Thank you. Shot. Yes, I do. I'm very sorry. I have to shoot off. I'm committed to be on another panel, and because this one's overrun, I'm already late for that one. Um, the... So, um, my goodness, there's just so much to say in all the questions that were asked. Um, and uh, I don't want to get into a spat with the very distinguished president of the Law Society, so I'll avoid doing that. But I would like to say I enormously admire the stance she's taken on so many issues publicly, except to my great sense of perplexity, this one, uh, where that's the first time I've heard a public statement admitting there might be a bit of an issue here, and that's great, and I wish that were firmed up into a law society position, because even without knowing what the solutions are, I think admitting that there is a problem yeah. is a really important first step. Yeah. So the truth is I'm one of those very annoying people who thinks they've spotted a problem but has no idea what the solution is. And I, I say that because it is clearly extremely complex. There's no doubt about that. My solution would be that a multi-stakeholder group should sit round the table getting very fine minds together and try and find out what the possible options are. What are the solutions? Uh, what are the options? What would be acceptable to different groups of stakeholders and so on? Now, it may be there is simply no solution to this. And in the end, we're going to come down to 
individ individual ethical judgments by lawyers and law firms, and they are going to be faced with commercial drivers and often will take um, decisions that are not within the public interest, but, but are within the law. So that may be the outcome. I'm not a pessimist, however. Uh, I think that getting admitting there is a problem and getting sensible people around a table, yeah. we will find some outcomes. I guess my concern for the profession, and I, I address this specifically to the Law Society, actually, is that if you mess this up, then you might find solutions imposed on you that you don't like, that probably aren't the optimal solutions, that may not be the interests of the wider society, that may impinge unnecessarily on some of those really important access to justice provisions that we all want to protect. Um, but they've been sort of compromised by those who are exploiting them. Um, and there might be a counter reaction to that. So, you know, I would say, please admit there's a problem and then we can have a proper conversation about solutions. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Um, Robert, uh, sorry, Jeremy, then Zelda, then Jennifer, a minute each on that question. So, so on the question, I mean, clearly um, uh, th there's no, I don't envisage there being an arbitrator in the sky who, who determines what is ethical and what isn't ethical. Um, what I do think in our approach actually is enabling ethical decision making and so setting in place frameworks, we've done this with our board and our executive and then a cascade into leadership and their teams around how do you set about ensuring your decision making is ethical. Um, so it's a little bit of a mindset and a frame and hopefully that will have some, some benefit. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to agree, admitting there's a problem is the first step, because for me, that was all I ever wanted to happen mm -hmm. when I went to Simons, Muirhead and Burton, who represented me, and I wanted to break my NDA. That's when everything went wrong again in 2017, because they weren't prepared to admit that there was a problem, because that was too frightening for them. And it's not ethics-led. Decisions aren't being ethics-led. So I think the fact that you're bringing ethics back to the fore is really important because actually surely law should be led by ethics um, and every single lawyer and every single situation that I got into around you know my NDA and other people's NDAs the first response of any legal professional is fear shut down and not looking at the ethics but looking at the reputational damage that might come to them and that's just looking at it the wrong way around mm. and actually you know we all want law to work better law is there to protect all of us it's meant to you know we're all meant to be equal in the eyes of the law and currently we're not and that's an ethical and ethical and power problem lovely thank you Jennifer. um if we can be helpful to the law society please let us know um I would say the answer is that you don't approach it thinking that you know the answer. That's probably a good start. Um, and <laughs> that it's given the space to be discussed and usually an answer will present itself. I think part, part of the problem is that we arrive thinking that we have to know and sometimes we, we just don't know. And to say that is a great start to make the space so that the truth can come out. And also often it's really bloody obvious. This one is really bloody obvious. Yep. Who, which Thank you. human being could allow Zelda to sign a not NDA that didn't allow her access Medical. to therapy? Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. You could put conditions around it. They, you know, not we are and why? And why is that not a criminal offence? Sorry. Well, actually, I think they're probably, they probably there. There was there was there was quite a strong argument that there had been a criminal offence, and the SRA did try to. Um, prosecute one of the solicitors involved and for medical reasons and the, the case didn't go ahead uh, is the uh, and that you know that you can make of that what you will but the uh, it, it the it, it is it is very troubling the um uh, this gentleman is you've got, we've got 40 seconds so if you can be very brief yes please thank you very much um, I guess it's more of a... Hi, Paresh Kafrani from Legal Utopia. It's more of a um, comment rather than a question, although it can be a question. That I think a, a lot of the... What do, we, what do we mean by ethics is a good question. I think we take a very consequential, uh, instrumental approach to ethics. As long as the right consequence is achieved, that's the most important thing. But there is another facet to ethics as the way in which that decision is reached. Mm -hmm. And I think that distinction is very important because if we focus on the latter the way in which it's reached, and that places an emphasis upon um, education, training, and so forth. So it's often getting to the right decision ethically might just be, you know, 
a question of luck or a question of taking into account factors which might not be that relevant, but it's the way in which our decisions reach that, that sort of deontological approach, which I think is very important. Lovely. Thank you very much. Lovely point to end. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Thanks to all of you. Good.